everyone wanted to welcome you all to the Comparative Media Studies Writing Colloquium. Uh, tonight is our tremendous honor uh, to hear from my colleague, the brilliant Helen Elaine Lee, who will read from her latest novel, Pomegranate, and just a couple of words about CMSW and our colloquium. Uh, universities like MIT uh, are always with their breath, almost impossible to grasp. I think, and it's probably um, just uh, the fact that I'm a CMS person, that um, you can get a sense of what a place like MIT does best um, at a place like the CMSW. Our colloquium, in many ways, um, is where MIT meets itself, where the sciences, the social science, the humanities, and arts come together. And uh, Helen is uh, absolutely emblematic of that kind of meeting and that kind of genius. Uh, I wanted to bring up my colleague, uh, Fatih Nawaz, who will introduce Helen, uh, novelist, fantastic book. Uh, if you haven't read it, go see them. Really, just talk about two powerhouses. <coughs> and Fatine, please, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's lovely to be here. My name is Fatina Bas. I am a lecturer in fiction writing in CMSW. And it's my honor today to introduce Professor Helen Elaine Lee and her new novel, Pomegranate, which came out in April and has received some rave reviews, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, but before I get to the reviews, I'd like to talk about my experience of the novel. Um, I first heard Helen give a reading from Pomegranate in the spring. And the reading was so beautiful and so moving that I literally had tears in my eyes, which doesn't often happen to me at readings. And I don't think I was the only one in the room in that condition. Um, so I was really looking forward to the book and finally had the pleasure to read it over the summer. And I have to say that Pomegranate lived up to that first deep impression uh, Helen's reading made on me. It's the beautifully told story of Renita Atwater, just released from prison after a four years uh, sentence for opiate possession. And it tells of her struggle and fight to reunite with her children, her family, to overcome the temptations and traumas of her past and to build a new future. As she also looks back on this transformative experience of love she has in prison with a woman, another fellow inmate. For me, as a reader, Pomegranate does what literature and the novel especially do best, which is to take me so deeply and profoundly and poetically into the experience of another person that my own sense of humanity and empathy and compassion is enlarged. And I'm not the only one who is deeply impressed by the book. Pomegranate was selected as one of the top 10 books of the year by Amazon. The Amazon editor who writes about the novel says, this empathy expanding novel is like a pomegranate. Break it open and you'll find a treasure trove inside. Buzzfeed News states that Lee writes beautifully about the healing power of black kin networks, queer love, community support systems and literature. It has received starred reviews from Publishers Weekly and Booklist. Publishers Weekly writes that with a light poetic touch, Lee balances the painful details of Renita's reality with genuine, persistent hope for new beginnings. It's irresistible. And I can go on and on, but I'd also like to mention the acclaimed authors who have also praised the novel, including Tayari Jones, who writes, with empathy, insight, and hope, Pomegranate reveals the hidden heartbreak of the women touched by incarceration, prepared to be challenged and changed. And Jacqueline Woodson, who writes that Helen Elaine Lee has brought such a deep and beautiful world of people to the page. In their survival, we find ours and we are left grateful, different, better. 
So this is pomegranate, but before I close, I also want to say a little more about Professor Lee beyond pomegranate. Professor Lee is, of course, Professor of Comparative Media Studies Writing here at MIT. In addition to this latest novel, Pomegranate, she is also the acclaimed author of the novels The Serpent's Gift and Watermarked. And her writing has appeared in magazines and anthologies, including Plowshares, Callaloo, Prairie Schooner, Hanging Loose, Best African American Fiction, as well as the New York Times Book Review, amongst other places. Though I haven't been at MIT long, I've been here long enough to know that Helen's contribution to the MIT community has also been profound, to CMSW, to women's and gender studies, to black studies, and in creating a space for creative writing here at the university. Outside of the university, Helen is, has also served on the board of Penn New England for 10 years, during which time she served on its Freedom to Write committee and volunteered with its prison creative writing program, which she also helped establish. Incarceration as a symptom of trauma, as a condition evoking histories of slavery and oppression, as a space of suffering as well as possibility, are all important themes in Professor Lee's work, and Pomegranate treats these themes beautifully. So again, I congratulate Professor Lee on the novel, and without further ado, I present to you Professor Helen Elaine Lee and Pomegranate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Move this way. <laughs> oh, thank you, um, thank you, Fatine, for that for that, that introduction. And this is a lovely chance uh, for all of you to meet her, new member of CMSW, wonderful fiction writer, as Juno, as Juno mentioned, of the novel Ghost Season, which came out this spring. And I also wanted to mention another new member of of my department, Brianna Williams, who writes um, powerful fiction and nonfiction and teaches both. And it's so exciting to have these two talented sisters join our community. Um, a huge thank you to Ken Manning, uh, my colleague and dear friend, who has supported me in my writing about the lives of imprisoned people from the very first and who arranged and organized this event. And to, uh, I want to thank Ruth Perry, who's going to lead the Q&A after I read. She's also been there with support and love from the beginning of my 28 years at MIT. Thanks also to LBGTQ Plus Services, Women's and Gender Services, and the Office of Multicultural Engagement for co-sponsoring the event. Um, and to my colleague and dear friend, Joaquin Terones, and student Savannah Lawrence, who helped to, to get the word out about the event. And finally to, well, not finally, to Belmont Books for coming to sell the books tonight, and, and to all of you for being here. So is this mic on? Because it, yeah, can I? I don't think so, I don't think so either. Because it's for the recording, it's not for the whole room. <laughs> so, okay. Can people in the back be heard? So there isn't a mic that helps me be heard, or okay, it's hard. I I have a soft voice, so I thought we would have that. Okay. In any case, so in uh in pomegranate. Renita Atwater tells her story of getting out of Oak Hills prison after her, a four-year bid for opiate possession and trying to stay clean, repair her relationships with her kids, own her love for the woman on the inside who's helped to inspire her, and grapple to accept and tell her full and complex story. And Renita's voice is intercut with that of a third-person narrator who brings alive the history revealing some of the pivotal moments in Renita's life at Oak Hills and during her growing up that inform her present tense journey. So I'm going to read from three parts of the novel tonight, um, an excerpt with a little skipping around from the first chapter, and then a, a chapter from the middle of the book, and then the preface, so kind of moving backwards. And I'm going to talk a little bit between and around what I read to, to give a, a, a bit of framework. So. Here are Renita's opening words. So, uh, so this is um, two, February 2019 <clears throat> when she gets out. I live my life forward and backward. Seems like my body remembers what I can't afford to forget. I'll be carrying on, trying to choose right, and then the past comes for me rumbling from my chest into my shoulders, 
pushing through my neck and up into my head. I try and answer its call, own where all I've been. Remember, even when forgetting, feels like the only mercy. Four years of captivity and here I sit on this hard plastic chair surrounded by cinder block about to leave Oak Hills, waiting to be thrown back to the world and I cannot get still. My knees jackhammer, my feet tap, they got wills of their own. My interlocking fingers steeple and flatten and steeple. I try and empty my mind, but my Oak Hills life thunders to the surface and flashes before me like those shifting pieces of colored glass in the tin kaleidoscope I had when I was six. Damn, really? On my out day, which is stressful enough. I choose a pomegranate and try to see myself holding it, broken open in my hands. Leathery skin, pointy stalk, jeweled seeds. And I can just about feel the shape and weight of it again when I hear the shout, did I say you're free to go? And I'm surprised to find myself standing up. I look the overseer in the eye, why give him a name when all I am is inmate, and rein in my anger as I sit my ass back down. It's true what they say about time slowing down the shorter you get. These last few days of inch by, me hoping and praying I've got it in me to keep doing right. I wait to get back the belongings I came in with, wondering what my stuff will look like to me now. Clothes that no longer fit, cheap pleather purse full of what? Lip gloss, suspended license, empty wallet, two keys that no longer open anything. <clears throat> dear God, dear power greater than me, whoever, whatever you are, let me prove I deserve to be a mother to Amara and Theo. Let me handle my business, work my program, stay on track. Keep away from temptation. Avoid the people who can pull me down. In here, meetings give you the fellowship that gets you through and a place to say, to remember, you're a human with a story that's got a next chapter. Even if the confessing is excruciating, I'll find a meeting and go every day if I have to. Own being powerless and powerful, choose right. Behind the walls in this concrete desert, everything's regulated and decided for you. All the everyday stuff, the what's and the when's. Wake up and go to chow, get your meds, go outside and come back in, take a shower, go to sleep, line up for this, sit down and wait for that. And all those things that on the outside you do and pay no attention, behind the walls they're the high points of your day. Makes me feel like that German shepherd of Jasper's. He named him King and kept him in a chain link corridor. Nobody ever played with him or loved on him. He lived to eat. Buff that floor, scrape those plates, sew labels into these t-shirts, one after another and then some more. And so American flags for the folks who hate your kind to jab you with. Improve yourself with classes and groups. All day long you're told what and when and how and the cost of defiance too. And you hear the echoes of ancestors whispering that though the best chance of survival may be submission, that could also be the death of you. And love, affection, touch, the stuff that makes your heart keep beating, contraband. Now who I ask, can keep alive that way. Nothing much grows in here unless you go hard against the script. To keep alive, you gotta choose what you can, small though it may seem. Imagine yourself past the razor wire. Notice those trees and birds way in the distance. Look at the sky and picture it whole. You gotta see yourself free from the demon that rides you, believing something new, something clean can happen after all. Behind the walls, nothing small. And choosing, it's something precious, and it means life just might have some mystery in store for you. I choose you, Maxine once told me, and you're against the rules. Yesterday, at the end of my little leaving party, I stood there as she left the day room before me. All of my well-wishers were there. Gwen, Gwen and her latest boo, Avis, crocheting her endless blanket. Eldora and the family she builds, and mothers in here. Even my new Sally Keisha came, though she still thinks she can do her time solo. We ate the makeshift treats and canteen snacks they all chipped in, and everyone said what they'd do if it was them getting out. And when it was over, I watched Maxine's proud, upright back fade away. Tender, tough Maxine, along with her free world, free world walk 
in the way she breaks down the politics of just about everything 24 seven, her ink and her no nonsense way, nonsense way and her legal know-how. There's a world of other stuff inside. She can talk up pomegranates and make me taste them. She can conjure grass or clouds or cornfields, tell Chesapeake River banks and make me feel the current and the muddy floor. I wanted to run after her, call out to her, touch her. I love that back, that's what I was thinking. It's moles and scars, it's tats, it's, it's defiant pride, no matter what she's been through. Like most of us in here, the only sleep she knows is broken. Last night in my cell with the card everyone signed and the little in spite of gifts from the leaving party, so sweet and painful, and I, uh, <clears throat> I sat in my cell with the card everyone signed and the little in spite of gifts from the leaving party, so sweet and painful, and started counting down the last bit of time I owed. And I'm skipping forward just a little bit. I gathered up my worldly possessions, starting a pile on my bunk, laid out my second string beater sneakers, t-shirts, socks, two of the unsexiest bras you ever saw, and a week's worth of high-waisted gray cotton underwear you can't really call panties. Comb and hair grease, wounded dictionary. I unfolded the loose leaf paper Eldora pushed into my hand today, and my eyes teared up as I looked at what she'd shared with me from last summer's garden plot, though she had so little to spare. Pale discs from her bell peppers and zucchini seeds, smooth and eye-shaped. I'd already returned everything I borrowed from the donated library that made up the one cubic foot of reading and writing material allowed and passed on my flip top tuna and ramen noodles. Traded envelopes and paper for extra socks, put aside my extra toilet paper for Keisha, along with the little bars of soap that made me itchy and ashy, tossed my shower flip flops and that was it, what I had to show for my Oak Hills life. I was already wearing my good sneakers, my thermals, and the windbreaker that passes for a winter coat. Looking at my list of Boston area NA meetings before adding them to the pile, I tried not to be cynical about the names. Freedom Express, Clean and Proud, The Solution, South End Miracles. I read through the affirmations I put on index cards, remembering how embarrassed I was at first by their corniness certain that Jasper was having a good laugh at them, at me, from the afterlife. The cards and letters and artwork from Amara and Theo, the program from Daddy's funeral service, and the kites Maxine's left for me over the last two and a half years. I keep that cash inside the Bible a missionary prison volunteer gave me. The little paper messages that gave me and Maxine another way of touching and added some mystery and discovery to a world of regulations and taboos. No sacred space in here except the ones we create. We made do and left them behind the day room microwave where even if they were found, they could not be tied to us. Milagros, to be added to the free things list we make out loud and the one I keep on my own. Maxine got me plugged into recognizing and naming the things that cost nothing and don't depend on permission, the things available to everyone present and past tense, <clears throat> future too, one hopes. The smell of new cut grass, skipping stones, a curl of white birch bark, eyelash kisses, reading, looking, walking, even if it's only round and round the yard. And then this last piece, <laughs> should be a short piece. Heart sick at losing Maxine as I gained my freedom, I tried to focus on the blessing of having been with her at all. And then I named what I was grateful for, moving from macro to micro. I had someone who'd love me right, people on the outside who'd never stop showing up, children I could still earn back, 1,159 clean days, but who's counting, and a novel I'd just finished reading that was echoing through me, trees that would soon be in reach, and the photo of Amara, torn down the middle by a shakedown boot heel, had survived. I had mended it, and here it was on the pile right beside me. Okay, so, so um, in this novel, I, I wanted to examine experiences, generational, historical, contemporary, that have been wounding, and also to depict forces that have been sustaining and healing. 
Now, as the framework for Renita's journey is the emotional and psychological toll of this society's retributive carceral and criminal legal systems, I wanted to make readers feel the dehumanization and deprivation that Renita and her fellow imprisoned women experience. I wanted to show how addiction and trauma and sexual violence paved the way to imprisonment. And I wanted to connect the trauma of incarceration to this society's history of enslavement, its convict leasing and Jim Crow systems, its racial terrorism, sharecropping and exploitation through forced and unpaid and low wage labor. And also, I wanted to show the spirit of resistance that is healing, empowering, and ongoing, and that is a fundamental aspect of the story of black survival in this country and throughout the diaspora. The forces of collective action, kinship, imagination, connectedness, nature, creative expression, love, have always inspired us to make a way out of no way. For the second excerpt, I'm gonna read a chapter, one that is necessarily painful, from about halfway through the novel. And it, this, this now is in the third person narrator's voice, and it flashes back to a visit Renita's father makes with her children to Oak Hills when she has been locked up um, for a year. All right. Okay, so this is 2016 at Oak Hills. They listened for their names, visualized their people coming through the trap, bargained with their higher powers. Today, God willing, they would get a visit. If they heard their names, they answered with relief and often tears. If they didn't, there was another absence to add to all the others as they receded further and further from the free world. Renita felt blessed. Her family was coming. She focused on her little bit of forward motion and even with what would follow, she couldn't wait to be with them a year in and clean. Back at the jail, post-arrest, her, her father had been two feet away and unreachable on the other side of the glass that was magnifier and mirror. She'd watched him mouthing words she couldn't hear until she pointed to the phone she was holding and the one beside him. Before he left, like everyone else, she had pressed her hand to the glass and he'd done the same. How well she knew that palm that was nearly twice the size of hers and oil stained. When she moved hers away, obeying the order to return to her cell, and his lingered on the glass, she had choked back sobs. At Oak Hills, the glass partition was gone, but she knew the passage through the trap was still a trial. If he made it there after the hour and a half drive, he'd be sitting with Amara and Theo, along with all the other expectant families, waiting to be called. Marooned on the waiting room pews, worn out elders tried to keep control of the kids they had in tow. Dressed in matching outfits, boys in navy and girls in pink, hair freshly done and skin lotion, they chased each other round and round until a frown from a guard or a warning from a grandma brought them in line. Want me to tell your mama how you're acting? Why couldn't they just sit quietly? The elders shook their heads and tried to get ready for the metal detector and the stamp, the heartbreak and the inexplicable situation in which they found themselves, the making do and acting happy and all the questions they were so unequipped to answer. Too much to manage and not enough help or time or money or energy or thanks. Kids who would not obey, pressing with their wise and them, aunties, Grandma's left to deal with it. No good explanation for why Mama had been taken way up here, why she was gone again. No good explanation for any of it. When would they get there? And why did the bus ride take so long? Why did the bathroom smell that way and have no toilet paper? Why were there no toys to play with? Why did they search the youngest one's diaper? Why didn't the man in blue ever speak to them, even to answer their highs? Why was Mama living so far away? Why did they have to wait so long? How could they explain any of it? And how could they unravel why sometimes, even though you came all the way up there on the bus because the car needed fixing or was taking someone else to work, and you'd done each and everything correctly, abiding by the rules for dressing and touching and talking and being, they call the code 99 and lock the place down. 
and you turned around and went home without any good explanation of why they couldn't see mom that month. Because they answered, just because. Matter of fact, they had questions of their own. They'd like to ask why anyone thought it was a good idea to degrade and shame parents in front of their children, to separate them and punish them, and why their children's glistening and newly braided hair was seen only as a way to smuggle contraband. They'd like to ask who, after all, would want to keep people locked up for a living. I'd rather be on unemployment, they thought. I'd rather be on welfare for the rest of my goddamn life. Look at that one over there behind the plexiglass and the counter now thinking he's something other than a slave. They might have had no choice about doing as they'd been ordered, but they could decide to never ever give the guards the satisfaction of looking them in the eye. After Lennox had surrendered his, his driver license and produced the kids' birth certificates and proof of guardianship, he put their outer layers of, layers of clothing along with his watch, wallet, eyeglasses, and phone in a locker and deposited a quarter in exchange for a little orange key. Wait, he said, gently pulling Amara back to remove her barrettes, and then opening the locker to add them and get another coin. Jesse was still talking about the blow of having to surrender her gold chain with the praying hands pendant to a CO's custody after she'd made it into the trap. They found seats beside another family while a drug detection dog walked past, sniffing at their legs. Most of those who sat waiting knew the dog would not stop at them. There was nothing to detect. Still, they couldn't help tumbling back to the lurking ambush of the countryside and the stop and frisk terror of the city. And it never ceased to unnerve the knowledge that they could suddenly, disastrously run afoul of the law, which had never meant to serve or protect them. At last month's visit, when five-year-old Theo has re had reached out to pet the dog, the guard had cut him off with a cold, knife edge, no touching, he's working, and Theo had cried. He hadn't stopped mentioning the rebuke, and today he clung to Lennox's arm as man and dog walked by. All around them, restless and nervous kids, kids goofed, argued, wove in and out of the benches, but instead of pinging around with the restless energy, Amara and Theo sat motionless and deflated. When Lennox smiled at the three stair-step kids beside him, the toddler hid her face in her grandma's sleeve. The middle one smiled uh, and, and pointed to her missing front teeth. And the eldest said, hi, mister, their mama locked up too. Grandma apologized, pulling him closer and launched into what she told them on the bus about how to act. And then they were called and she was getting to her feet, pulling her string of little ones along. Why can't they call us, Amara asked with sudden, su sullen sadness. Again and again, Lennox looked at his wrist, though the only thing to see was a pale band of freckled brown skin. He pulled the locker key from his pocket and put it back three times. The slacks and button down he wore whenever he was not at work were well within the rules, but he looked at the dress code posted on the, on the wall in English and Spanish for men. No blue denim pants, no cargo pants, no double-layered clothing, no sweatsuits, no hooded sweatshirts or jackets, no t-shirts, no pockets with holes. It was more challenging for women, as Jessie had found. She'd been turned away once for excessive pockets. No skirts with slits, no skirts more than three inches above the knee, no shorts, no skirts. What in God's name was a skirt, he'd asked her. No tank tops, no halter tops, no scarves, no low-cut tops, no form-fitting stretch pants, no bathing suits. Another question for his sister. Who would wear a bathing suit to the penitentiary? No sheer clothing, with or without a bra. At her first visit, Jessie's underwire bra had set off the metal detector, and she'd been taken to a little room for a pat-down search at the hands of a stone-faced stranger. After standing with her arms outstretched, pulling the wire away from her rib cage and her waistband from her belly, lifting the bottoms of her feet while trying to balance on one leg like a ridiculous flamingo stuck in the least exotic of places, she had come braless in a pullover that was roomy enough to hide the evidence of her drooping middle-aged breasts, but not too baggy to prevent entry. When their turn finally came, the heavy metal door rattled open and shut behind Lennox and the kids, and they were taking off their shoes and putting them in a bin, turning out their pockets, getting the black light stamps on their wrists, and walking through the metal detector archway. Through it all, Lennox stood tall 
and looked past the cold, dismissive glances of the guards who puffed out their chests with self-importance and shook their heads at the failure of his family, his people. He answered the question on the clipboard he was handed, have you ever been convicted of a crime, writing a big, bold, uppercase no. Coming through the buzzing gates with a child by each hand, he moved toward visitation, looking down at their feet and their three gleaming shadows on the buff linoleum floor. 14, 15, 16 steps and 23 to go until the next door, a right turn and then 12 more. Now sitting for the final wait, he watched the door. As soon as she entered the room, Renita heard the voices of children and saw the mothers, grandmas, aunties, and sisters who sat with them, and the few men who stood out, stood out like trees on the prairie. There was Daddy sitting with her babies, who were almost too beautiful to bear. Kids chattered and jumped around, trying hard to entertain themselves with out-of-date highlights magazines and a few worn or disabled toys a truck with three wheels, a doll with matted blonde hair and sightless blue eyes. They argued and complained, this one hit me, that one teased me, this one took my seat. A boy stood apart, arms folded and tucked to his body, silent and wary of his disappearing, reappearing mom. A toddler, dressed in the denim and timberlands of a miniature man, stiffened in his mother's insistent hug. A family played gin rummy, with a deck of limp cards. The Oak Hills women ached for these visits, proof that life and love go on. And once they came, they weren't sure they could endure the stilted positivity. The walls with their fake wood paneling seemed to close in, and the cheerful posters of panda bears and smarmy memes mocked. The lit up soda and junk food machines enticed, only to overcharge and disappoint. And the overseers looked on with pity and indifference. Still, there were miracles, the hugs for bodies craving touch, the loving faces returned to them briefly, smile, smiling in spite of the mournful mood. A mother played peekaboo over and over, glowing at how she could make her baby smile. A couple stared with hope and longing into each other's eyes as they claimed this now. Trying to refuse the blank surveillance eyes of holstered guards that ravaged every intimacy, Renita made her way to the children who sat eerily quiet and the father who was still showing up for her, nodding and saying afternoon to those she passed as she heard Lennox's voice inside her head. We speak to each other wherever we are. It binds us. It says we're people, whatever they think or say or do. She gave her father a quick squeeze and a kiss and then squatted down to Theo's height and tried to put her arms around both kids. Amara's arms hung limp and Theo reached for her, then pulled away. As soon as they sat down, the visit started slipping through her fingers. They'd just arrived and her first thought was how long until they had to go. How are you doing, Nita, Lennox asked, and she answered, fine, I'm doing fine. They'd always been good at talking without going anywhere painful. How have you been keeping busy, Lennox asked. Hmm, I've been reading again, it seems to help, and crocheting. She asked about school and after school and the neighborhood kids, but every try at conversation, lighthearted or probing, fizzled. She sent them to the vending machine she wasn't allowed to use, hoping her father would say something real about how they were doing, but he just sat between the chairs they had vacated, looking morose. She knew his credo, keep on providing, keep on loving. How did you talk about a thing like prison without making things worse? You feeling good, Mama? Amara asked, seeming older than her 10 years when the kids were back at the table and digging into the snacks. Resisting the urge to promise that this time she'd conquer it, this time her recovery would take, she said she was working hard at being well. Looking over at the photographer who was setting up, Renita asked cheerfully, want to take a photo, the four of us? No one spoke or moved. She saw her father look over at the backdrop of turquoise water and palm trees, and then at the door. Renita had seen other mothers showing their photos around, and she wanted one too. Nodding at the family getting a picture taken, she said, look at them. Seems like it's a good thing, doesn't it? We can both have a copy, and that way we'll be able to see us all together anytime we want. We'll be seeing the same thing, maybe even at the same time. 
Amaro and Thea looked at each other. Lennox said, you all go on then, let it be the three of you. And when Renita stood, the kids did. The kids did too, walking with her to wait their turn. Renita paid for two copies, or her father did, since it was his money on her books. And when their turn came, they arranged themselves in front of the 2D beach, her on one knee with her right arm around Theo and Amara on her left, almost touching her. When she held one of the copies out to her father, he shook his head and said, I'd prefer a different reference point. She put it on the table in front of him, hoping he'd change his mind, and sat back down to look at herself with her children, frozen now in time. The air felt thick and heavy, and they tried for goodwill, but it was a carcass pick clean. They'd gotten Doritos and candy and soda from the vending machine, taken a photo, exhausted their news and their pretenses, and Renita wished she had things to share, but she was on pause from life. What could she tell them? She'd stood for count at 6 o'clock, 11.15, 4.30, and 9.30. She'd gone to chow, watched a spades game, and listened to stories about plants with tap roots, and watched women sneak affection in the day room. Buff LaFleur, gone to chow twice more, cried herself to sleep with regret and loneliness. She was story poor. They sat silently across from each other, running out the clock. And then, leaning across the table to take their hands, Renita went somewhere she knew was a misstep as she opened her mouth. I hate to see you leave. When you're gone, I miss you so bad. Amara, she saw Amara's face hardening, but she couldn't seem to stop talking. I picture you at the house or at school or playing out back. She saw Amara balling up her fist but kept going. And it's so tough being away from you. Sometimes I feel like my heart's breaking. And that was it, Amara Blue. What about us, Mama? Renita felt the faint spray of her daughter spit on her face as she shouted, it's like we're locked up too. Her cries shook her skinny 10-year-old body, and Renita, Renita looked over at the CO standing on the wall and was flooded with shame. He watched but registered no compassion, no mercy, no regard at all, as Renita got up and went to her daughter and took her in her arms. And Theo buried his face in his grandpa's side, asking Granddaddy, why can't Mama come home with us? When the tears subsided and Renita went back to her chair, Amara slid the photo closer and stared at it before saying, you'll get better, Mama. I know you will. Renita felt the last minutes of what she'd prayed for expire with mourning and relief. And just before the time was up, she couldn't help asking, when you think you'll come again? She watched them disappear from view, and now it was time to pay for her good fortune and prove the body's innocence. Herded into a private room, those lucky enough to have had a visit faced three COs, one a female who'd been detailed there for the protection of the women inside. You know the routine, she, she said, with icy detachment, making clear in case they missed it, that the whole thing meant less than nothing to her. They did know the routine. They learned it after every visit in the search for serious contraband, returning from a funeral, the hospital, a trip to court, and whenever some CO felt like it. With no choice but survival, they stripped like they had so many times, looking straight ahead and looking back to all the other takings embedded in their cells, human cargo passages and auction block appraisals. <clears throat> escapes and captures, rapes and other unrecorded conquests, lynching to entertain others and warn their kind, chain gangs and coffin cells, fire hoses and dog whistles and flaming crosses, police on the other side of the gun and on their necks. They handed their clothes over for inspection, burying the bodies that had kept track of their mishaps and hurtings, of the accidents and want and illness and aggression that had left their marks, along with the things they chose to say in dark blue ballpoint ink. Their flesh said, here's where I fell off my bike, where I scraped myself climbing that fence, where my adolescent back knee bloomed. This is from my C-section with my firstborn, and here's the mark from fighting off that Klansman CO. Here's the cigarette burn my ex gave me to remember him when I tried to get free. Here are the traces of the tracks I used to hide, and this is my first boyfriend's name, 
inked half my life ago. The fat around my middle is the story of canteen chips and empty calories of salt and starch and sugar that have passed for nourishment inside the walls. And this is where I muscled up, lifting and planking to, def to defend myself and fill the time. Here's what my body's got to say about the days and months and years spent where doctors and dentists and fresh air and sunlight have been in short supply. They spread their feet apart, lifted each one to show the soul, wiggled their toes, leaned forward and shook out their hair, folded each ear forward, tilted their heads back to expose the nostrils, opened their mouths wide, lifted their tongues, rolled their top and bottom lips, raised both arms, lifted their breasts and their fat rolls, pulled their any belly buttons open, rang their fingers through their pubes and spread their pussies, squatted, coughed three times, turned around, bent over, spread their ass cheeks, coughed again three times. They tried to go elsewhere, concentrated on the doorway, bit their cheeks, but they could feel the inside wounds, the tally kept from the punishments, the things they had been named and deemed, the ways they had tried and fallen short from the poisons in their blood and lungs that had seemed like liberation, from the ones who broke and entered using kinship and prayer as passwords, from the daily wound of being reckoned less than human, the toll of being thrown away like trash. Silently they chanted, this is my body, it is still here and it is still mine and it is known worse than this along with its portion of pleasure and kindness and love. It was mine, it is mine, it will be mine, but it is also just a body and I can leave it and go past hurt, past feeling, past anything you can do to me in here today. <laughs> okay, I know that was a lot. <laughs> So, so um, you know, in that in that chapter, we feel the the pain of historical, generational, and interpersonal violence echoing in the bodies and the souls of the characters, and, and we also feel this struggle to be human and complex, and defiant and hopeful and loving, within the context uh, of oppressive state authority. I'm not going to leave you there, though. <laughs> With the last um, short excerpt, I'm going to give you. Uh, some of the hope and the possibility that are threaded through Renita's journey of healing and self-acceptance and autonomy. So um, informing Renita's addiction are, are the ravages of her experience and her cultural inheritance, and yet the generative resources around and within her um, can be discovered and retrieved. So here, here I'm gonna read the preface, which gives you the framework for the novel. This is just two pages. <laughs> Mama was gone and not gone. She had disappeared into the hospital while Renita was at school, getting tamed and stuffed with facts and equations. And there she lay, immobilized by tubes and wires. Renita had stood beside her hospital bed, watching the blue ventilator bag fill and empty, trying to understand how Janita, Geneva Atwater had been felled by something as tiny as a blood clot. She had seen her dying. And after the mourners filed past Renita at the wake, grateful for the phrase that helped them navigate the sudden woe, sorry, so sorry, so sorry for your loss, she had stood beside the coffin and stared at her mother, lying in its white satin folds like a parody of a fancy gift box display. The shiny wig daddy knew she would have wanted, low on her forehead like a helmet, skin waxy and mouth pressed shut, eyes closed to her for good now. She had seen her dead, but she heard her mother's voice in the back door alcove at the table in the basement, and now she would never please her, never tell her what she was keeping inside, never love her more than she feared her. A month after the funeral, she sat across from Annie Jessie, picking at one of the casseroles the church ladies kept bringing. She'd brought a book to the table, which had never been allowed, but there were fewer shouts 
and shalt nots now that Jesse had joined Daddy at the house until things eased up. He stretched out work as long as possible and escaped to go fishing on the weekends, and both he and Jesse tried to stave off the bloated gloom with food, encyclopedia facts, artificial cheer. Neither one talked about Geneva. Neither one asked Renita about her sadness. And what kept her what hurt kept haunting. This was the family way, sorry. And what hurt kept haunting like a hungry ghost. She heard the front door open and close, and there was Daddy in the archway, smiling like a moonlighting jester, chuckling from his belly like he was launching a magic trick. He pulled the dented orb from a brown paper bag, and Renita told herself to smile. She'd seen photos and drawings of pomegranates, but not a real one. Where'd you get that, she asked, more edgy than she intended, and his smile wobbled. She'd seen photos and drawings of pomegranates, but not a real one. <clears throat> oh, sorry. This is my place. Your birthday getting lost in the shuffle and whatnot, I thought, he began. She looked away. Eclipse was more like it. He put the fruit in her hands. There's no making up for what's past, but this here, it's got some surprising and wonderful news buried just inside. Expecting a whole lot of nothing, her fingers studied the scratched and ordinary skin. He said they should wait to open it. Sometimes waiting made things better. You hungry, Lennox? Auntie Jesse asked, getting him a plate and listening as he told about the engine repairs and paint restorations that had filled his day. She kept him chattering while Renita muted their voices in her head turning the pomegranate to take in its flat and faded spots, pressing on the sharp crown at the top. And when she was about to get up and wait on something else, he said, let's open it. Renita peeled back the rind and pried the bloodshot gems from the spongy membrane that held the whole thing together. She was struck silent, awed by the wild design of it and by the little bursts of sour sweet juice from the seeds that turned her fingers red. There was a whole world, strange and crazy beautiful, underneath the skin, layer on crooked layer of ruby crystals, and chambers like inside a heart. So, <laughs> to wrap up. <laughs> So we are all left to grapple with the echoing losses of our lives, but, but our bodies and our vision and our voices can be reclaimed. In our hearts, alongside the losses, are abundance and possibility. And the beauty around and within and between us, the gifts we've been given, the free things, all belong to us. And we may find our hands filled, perhaps through memory and imagination with what we need, and it may be something every day or seemingly small or ordinary on the outside and wondrous within. Thank you. So, I guess we <laughs> Okay. All right. So, I guess Ellen, Ruth is going to yeah, lead us in some questions in the questions and that answers. That was wonderful. Oh, I want to say that I read this maybe a year ago. Yeah, the galley. Yeah, and yeah, I, I really, hearing it read, I remembered the detail, the, the exquisite detail, and, and the, the way every sentence weighs a lot. Oh. Every sentence matters. And now I have to read it again. Oh, thank it's you. really beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah, it's you, true. Yeah. I'm supposed to do uh, uh, ask you to put your questions to this wonderful woman, um, and and she will answer them probably. <laughs> <laughs> I will try. <laughs> she yes. will try. Yeah. Um, I just learned, or I just remembered, really, uh, with um, the Rosh Hashanah. Uh, celebrations that you're supposed to eat pomegranates at Jewish New Year, that it's a symbol of the new year, which is makes it, a, you know, another layer of meaning yeah. to this title. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, 
you want me to talk about that a little? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> about the pomegranate. Why? Because people, that's, that's often a question I get, why pomegranates? Or, and, um, and I guess the, so uh, I began with pomegranates because a friend of mine who was incarcerated set, told me that she thought of a pomegranate as representing the rare and precious act of choosing when you're incarcerated. And, mm. and so that was what I, this story has had different iterations. It was originally part of a longer book about, a uh, longer novel about 10 people who are incarcerated. And then I, you know, I gave up on that and pulled Renita's story. She was one of those characters out of that and, and developed, you know, a, her, her own novel from that. But so that's what I started with, but then, um, I think you know, as writers, we have se we have seeds that we begin with, and then we keep, we work and revise, and and certain things gather meaning and become thematic concerns, like in ways that we didn't necessarily anticipate. So, um, I it came to to suggest this idea of the heart and the, uh, holding in it all the things that that you are, all the things you've been and done, all the things that have been done, mm -hmm. you know, to and for you. Uh, and that as Renita moves toward accepting her full story, you know, the, the, the losses, the missteps, you know, um, along with everything else, uh, she comes to see, you know, she comes to see her experience that way and, and, and her heart that way. And that, you know, you need everything you have, have been and done and, uh, for, for your full story. So, and then it's all the, all of the, um, you know, mythic uh, significance it has cross-culturally, you know, symbol of prosperity and fertility. And um, so, so and it has- And beginnings, and beginnings. And beginnings, uh, yeah, yeah. With, with the new year. So, so it, uh, those are some of the things that it, 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 it came to represent yeah. over the course of the book. So it became to be the, the central sort of symbol. I, I, wanna, I wanna just say a word about uh, one of the characters in this book, because I've read all of Ellen's work, and she always does, she always has one of these characters. It's Maxine in this book, a wise person who knows how to cut through the, the dehumanization of the modern corporate world, basically, yeah. um, and to remind, to remind herself and to remind the ones that she loves about what matters and where meaning inheres in life. And she and Helen always manages to create <laughs> such a character. And those are my favorite characters. Yeah. And yeah. Maxine is the one in this one. She's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm gonna read Maxine especially. Yeah, she yeah, she she is powerful. Yeah. Yeah, she's an instrumental yes. in, in Renita's healing, you know. It's unusual to have Yes. And so my, I guess my low-hanging fruit question is, what made you decide to bring some humanity to this population of mm. Did you hear it? No, I yeah. did. We were supposed to say. We're, we're supposed to say yeah, them again. Why, for why the, did I write about incarceration? <laughs> yeah, why, why yeah. write about incarcerated women? Yeah, um, well, uh, my father was planted the seed, I think, for this book in me, you know, uh, in my growing up, he was a criminal defense lawyer his whole um, professional life, and and he just he imparted certain understandings to me. I mean, wh that some of them were are, were that um, that uh, everybody's life is li life is complicated and um, worth seeing and, and hearing about, and not not a lot of us grow up without uh, full opportunities and choices, and justice is a fiction for some of us, and. And I think those, those sort of politics were what, you know, drove him to do to do the work he did. So, so he 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 gave me those understandings. But but also because the people that he represented were not invisible, you know, or other to me. They were part of our community. That was the understanding I got, you know. And I have he also gave me a sense. Both my parents did that. I was that I had a responsibility, you know, to use the access and the privilege that I had to to speak about, about what mattered. So I guess I'd always wanted to, you know, write something about incarceration. And so I started volunteering uh, first at a county house of correction for a year uh, on an experimental therapeutic 
unit, um, and that tended to be, that was men, they'd been in and out, and, and so at, uh, this was South Bay where you serve up to two and a half years, so there'd been a revolving door, addiction at the root of a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, people's lives, and they'd been in and out and in and out, and the idea was what if, what could, what could we create, what kind of unit could we create that would, you know, inter interrupt that? that cycle and so I volunteered along with a lot of other people. There was someone who taught um, Shakespeare. Uh, they did Hamlet and there was there were people who taught meditation and life skills and and I taught I did a little storytelling. I'm not sure you could really call it writing exactly because the literacy levels really varied and they were all, not all English speakers but they, it was, they were uh, workshops to get people thinking about what had mattered in their lives and to try to begin to tell tell stories about that. And then I got into, a, I was able, it was hard to find places that would let me volunteer because, you know, prisons don't want writers to come in and then write an expose. So it's a little bit challenging. <laughs> it was a little bit challenging to get in. But then I spent many, many years, uh, 50, 17 years going to Bay State. And uh, that's a, it was a medium security prison for, for men. And, and then uh, after some years of going and doing, it was a little bit more writing oriented, but still storytelling really. And I was one of uh, many volunteers who went to, t to do whatever it is they did in their life uh, to bring that, you know, you come and teach philosophy or talk about science or, or whatever, you know. And then uh, I was at, with Penn New England, I helped start a, uh, which uh, a more formal organized creative writing program and that ran for eight years at that prison and at um, Mi uh, Middlesex which was a um, pre-release facility related to Framingham the women's prison and so, so those are some of the I've taught in some other contexts too but those were the, the the experiences that really I drew on and that really formed me and when I started going I wasn't really sure what shape it would take or what would it be stories or a novel or what I really didn't know but I just listened for a couple of years and then the characters began to take shape and and that first novel that was called Life Without that was ten, uh, five women and five men so I was actually interested in in both and then um, you know that I, I wasn't able to get that book into the world and then I I you know pulled from it and um, and decided that I, Renita had a fuller story. So I had the, like the armature for the story from the way she had a, she was one of these characters threaded through that earlier book, but you know, fleshed it out. It changed a lot over the five years of writing it, I guess. And, and you really do get a sense from reading the book of what it's like to be in jail. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was very, I mean, it was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, because you, daily life came alive. Yeah, and just, you know, I, and disturbing. I know that sometimes just reading that, writing it was hard, and reading it is, you know, what the, the chapter that I just read. But I guess I do, I mean to disturb you. I mean, if, if over two million people live like that, and we could we should know he about hear it. about it yeah. and, and imagine it. But um, it, it, is, it is difficult territory, I will say that. Right, right. That's the hardest chapter, I think, in there, which is... <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I wonder if you would say more about the, you know, I, I write, and sometimes I write about sad things. I find, agonize, I find any kind of writing agonizing, but, but thinking about writing the sort of, some of the devastating scenes you write, like, I just can't imagine what, what like, do you, like, really try to get yourself in there, you associate entirely with the I'm just sort of curious, like, what you're most, like, I, I know how I have to get myself geared up to, like, a couple hours of writing. Yeah. Really hard stuff like yeah. How do, you, how do you get it out? How, so the question how, is, yeah. how do you prepare yourself to write? How do you get yeah. into the mood? How do you, is that right? For, well, the, for, the, for, the, for the hardest part. For, like for the you, hard yeah. parts. Yeah. How, okay. do you, okay. how do you write the difficult like parts, right? Anyway, but this is hard for me to imagine how I would, how I would do that. Yeah. Um, when I first started like working on that, earlier novel life without my son was really little and I did find I found it hard because I wanted to you know be the, uh, you know this positive force for, for him and so I think that I struggled with it in those early days a little bit but you know he's grown now <laughs> um, anyway, um, I don't know it's I mean writing is I think if it's what you do then you commit to it and you have a, and part of what 
allows you to go the difficult places and also deal with just the uncertainty and doubt of writing, which is a horrible, you know, it's pretty horrible to, to, to fathom, is, is by having a practice, you know. So I think I have a, I have a, and it's not a, it, it has evolved into something not too complicated. I sit down and I work, you know, <laughs> and if I do that before I do anything else. You know, in the day, and I try to do that if, every day, if not, if, if I'm teaching, it, it becomes more difficult. And, I, and in terms of emotional difficulty, um, I think you, you draw on what you know about those, those pain, about pain and difficulty, about, you know, I haven't been through this experience, but I know some things about violation, you know, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and being wounded and, uh, and the difficulty of coming to terms with that, of facing that. So, you know, you, it's, it's, um, it's tough, but you, you, uh, you pull on your own experience. I don't know, I, I put my head down on the table and cried sometimes when I was reading. You know that that scene, that section, and and I, I think uh, I don't know. There's other things that Renita goes through. You know, the childhood experiences are some of her her trauma too that she's coming to terms with, and and the, some of the love relationships she's had. You know, and uh, some I realized as I was writing her her relationship with Jasper. You know, I used I used what I what I knew of that too, and that, those were probably the Maybe because the parallels were so were so direct, because I do know something about settling or letting yourself letting oneself be mistreated, or you know the, remaining silent, or mm -hmm. uh, you know not not standing up for yourself, or wanting so you know to be loved that you give yourself away. So you know I was pulling on all of those things, and that was those were really painful. But I don't know, it was probably therapeutic too. It was hard. <laughs> it was hard. I don't think there's any writing is really hard. You know, every time you do it, and if it, if you're going somewhere difficult, it's even, but you know, like Dorothy Allison, Allison says, if you aren't terrified, then you're not doing anything on the page. You know? so, so I don't know. It's I think you commit for me anyway. I commit to it. I have a practice, and I just understand that being rocked by it is going to be part of the territory. Mm. Yes. Yeah. in your writing the external reality and the external struggles like incarceration and social injustice and then things that are generational and embodied and felt and kind of persistent just through her lived experience. Yeah. I guess it, it's all connected. I mean, I think we live it in that connected way. And for her, it's, you know, it's all connected. I mean, it's some, it, you know, the, the mother trauma um, being, emotionally invalidated by her mother, sort of, a, there's a kind of erasure that goes on, you know, that, that is, and then she, well, I don't want to give up the story away, but other, <laughs> other, you know, childhood trauma she experiences, that, that's, con the addiction is about, is a, is a sane response, right, in fact, you know, to that, to those experiences, and so, um, the, the need for oblivion or to be, to be, you know, soothed, so, and then the, you know, it's the addiction that leads her to incarcer incarceration. So it's all, you know, it's all connected. Like in her story, uh, plot-wise, or you know, emotionally and psychologically. But it's connected for all of us, I think. You know, and that's, I think that's the other idea about the pomegranate heart. You know, is that it's all, it's all in there. It's all part of, part of you know, who you are. When she finally, she has to go to psych psychotherapy because that's mandated for family reunification. So, and then she makes this journey as she becomes to trust this psych black gay psychotherapist and there's a bond between them. And, and, um, and she, she says to him once she's finally been able to speak some of the things she's never told that, that have happened to her, you know, it's never going to go away, is it? And he's like, no, well, no, it's, it's not. It's part of you, part of you but you can uh, live out, you know, differently with respect to it. Or it can play a different role, you know, in, in the way that you live. And so, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, talking circularly a bit, but it, I think it's, it's all connected. All the different things that happen are all in the heart, all part of you. And if interrogated and examined and 
um, you know, work through. You, you can it, those things can play a different role, you know, but they're there, part of your story, always. There's a lot of seeds in that pomegranate. <laughs> yeah, There's yeah, there are. There are. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm uh, yeah. Stephen. Yeah, Steve. This is a joyous question because I want to have the occasion to, to go there. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. But you can, dive, you can dodge the question if you want to. But um, This book is so much about containment. I mean, the joy of the inside of the pomegranate is contained in the crusty outside, which is contained in the occasion of its mm. appearance. And um, Renita's problem is, is what's going on inside her body. But then her body is, con then that's contained within her body. But her body is contained in a family and a prison, and then the prison is contained in a structure of laws. Uh -huh. and, then, and then it turns into a story about stories within stories. So yeah. there are all these containments. And um, incarceration becomes a really complicated metaphor. And I guess my question is, You've worked with so many people for whom incarceration is not a metaphor, but a, f a fact. Yeah, you know, it's the, yeah. Do you ask their permission? How do you, how do you? Yeah, um, well, when I start, when I, with the people I volunteered with, I, I was honest that I was going to write, that I was writing something, and they read some of the, sto some of the stories that were part of Life Without were published. Uh, and I, they read some of those, and I, Yes, I did. I was honest about it. I didn't want it, you know, I, I, I wanted to earn the story, I guess, because I ha hadn't had those direct experiences and, and did not feel appropriative or. Did you show uh, pieces? Yeah, I, sh I showed them some pieces, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure in terms of the containment, though. Hmm. I'm not sure, how, sure. That's an interesting idea of like sort of concentric circles or something, and that, that's what our lives are like, like a widening out of, and I would say in, intersecting, I guess, all of it connecting up as well. Um, I don't know. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to pry. Yeah, but, no, no, but that's fine. There are people for whom it's not a metaphor. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful metaphor in the book, but it... Well, well, I hope it doesn't feel like a metaphor when you read it. I, I mean, I think that's the, that's the power of fiction, is that it opens up the emotional yeah. and live experience, of, you know, of, of the character. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I think there's so much powerful work, social science work, and you know, I don't know, anthropological work and you know, data about incarceration. But what gets you to experience the realness is is fiction, and so that's why that's what I thought my contribution could be. So I certainly hope yes. it doesn't feel like a, a metaphor is one of the tools a writer has to make that lived experience hit home, you know, but I, ho I hope, hope it doesn't feel like that when you're reading. <laughs> what? I meant it as praise. Oh, yeah, okay, well, you know poets, so. Yeah, but you know what I mean, the metaphor is in service to, you know, reality. yeah, to, this, to, to the way that, that you receive, you know, the, the story and the way that you're hopefully, you know, expanded by the story. Michelle. I have had some people who've been incarcerated at readings and come up to me and say, I don't know, it resonated or it captured, you know, their experience. I was just in Atlanta doing a fundraiser for an organization called um, 
I was there to talk at Emory, but also ended up doing this thing for mothers be mothers. Motherhood Beyond Bars is the organization, and it, it helps women who actually give birth in prison, and their kid, then their kids are taken you know, from them and try to keep the connection between these kids and the mothers going. And um, they, I was, my publisher donated 50 books, and they are giving those book, most of those books to women on the inside. So um, I mean, hopefully there will be a, wow. way to, a way to hear you know, some feedback. That's neat. Yeah. Yes. You commented that, that uh, fiction allows you to access things in a way that you may not if you know it's not fictional. But the writing of the book, and uh, I mean, even in reading uh, about your experience with incarcerated people, does not give a, a reality that in some way doesn't make it seem fictional. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you, how do you, how do you, I mean, you, you offer your interactions as, as a source of your inspiration, but how do you kind of allow people to feel that that fictional intimacy? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like distance themselves. How do you mediate? How, that? how do you do that? Um, how do you manage to make it real? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, not, but, but make it credible, but not make it seem appropriated. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you're sort of like asking, like the core question is, how, how do you write a story? Or how do you, you know, how do you, I mean, you, you, I think fiction uses, you know, the facts of, experience as a jumping off point, you know, and then, it, then your job is to imagine, you know, and, and the writer's job is to imagine lives different than her own, you know, always, I think, and to draw on her own experience and understanding and, and research, you know, I did the volunteering, I also read a lot and watched films, and, uh, you know, and there's, there's things like the Marshall Project, which is the biggest sort of clearinghouse about the criminal legal system and incarceration, is it has a website and they have a column, Life Inside, where people who are incarcerated write, you know, and you get details and you get... So I guess the goal was, how, what are the details that are going to make it ring true, that are going to make it, you know, and so some of the, that's having enough details about what daily life, is, you know, is like or... Um, there, there's that kind of thing. There's that kind of. Uh, it's like the Flannery O'Connor thing. F fiction requires the strictest attention to the real, right, to the concrete. So you have those concrete details. You've done enough research and talked to enough people, and you know, absorbed enough to know, to to figure out which things, which details are going to communicate a, a sense of realness, right? And then I guess the, the rest of it, though, is the emotional, psychological realness. So you build characters, you know, and you do that bit by bit I, with, through revision and revision and revision and uh, figuring out how somebody is going to talk and making, I, I guess, giving the characters complexity and depth, you know, and um, Renita, I, for her, you know, she had to have the, certain wounds and, and part of the reasons, you know, that she had to be, um, had to have experienced um, some of the trauma she had is because, it, because of what the data we have about uh, incarceration. So, for example, a 2016 uh, Vera Institute of Justice study found that 86% uh, of women incarcerated had experienced uh, sexual violence in their lives. And 82% uh, has struggled, struggled with uh, addiction, with substance use disorder. And, uh, and also almost 80% of uh, incarcerated women are mothers, many of them raising you know, children on their own. So you know, I wanted to uh, be true to those realities. And so some of the things I, I have, you know, made happen to her uh, were important in, in that sense, right? And then, and then you know, just asking, so what are the kind of, you know, what makes a person, you know, make the, uh, I don't want to say choice exactly, but what, you know, what drives, a, what drives somebody like, like Renita toward, you know, addiction and toward, it starts out at, 
with uh, Vicodin and pills like that. And then in the last experience, it's, it's heroin. And that's largely because of the man she gets involved with. Well, you know, what is the psychological? What's the background? What's the makeup? What's the life history, you know, that would, that would make her, um, you know, that would drive her or land her, you know, where, where she ends up at, at Oak Hills? And then, so there's all of that part. But then to make her complex, and a real person on the page, she also has to have resources to work with because I want her to have, I, I believe she get, will get out and make it, right? I believe she has what it takes, you know, to, to get her kids back and own her, her uh, love for Maxine and uh, accept herself. And maybe she'll, we all will continue to screw up, right? That's, part, that's what life's like, but, she, but that she will be on, just continue on her journey of, of autonomy and healing and, and self-acceptance. So, you know, I decided she, she would be a reader, you know, because, she, because books, are the kind, books can save us, right? They are, they've been the saving thing in my life. Uh, you know, my mother, as my dad gave me those things I mentioned, my mom gave me books to see by, and she was a literature professor. So I, you know, I'm drawing on my own experience, but I also met a lot of incarcerated people for, you know, who, who kept alive, kept, you know, that way, um, through, through reading and through knowledge. And, and so then, you know, I asked, well, what's the, how does she come to reading? And I come up with, for example, that her father gives her encyclopedias and encourages her to be interested in the world and intellectually interested and curious in the world, you know. So those are some, things, some resources I, I give her. She sings. She has stopped singing because of uh, the trauma that has happened to her. And so then, you know, but music is a thing. And um, dancing is it? I, I give her enough, um, you know, things to draw on and, and pull on that she has a, uh, that she has a chance. And then she's got a family, you know, that stand, that stands by her, um, and you know, has sometimes drawn a line though, uh, and that's, I, uh, you know, something about what it is to love someone who struggles with addiction, you know, so I, I have some things to draw on loved ones and family members who struggle with that issue, you know, so I try to do justice to that with the detail. So I could go on and on, but I guess I'm trying to illustrate, like you ask, you ask yourself as a writer, what, what could have, what is, you have to be curious, I think, about what makes people do what they do, you know, so what could it be that has happened to her that would, would make her, you know, behave this way, and then we're all complicated, you know, not, none of us are whole and undivided. So she would, I wanted her to have the complexity of both the, 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 um, uh, the, things that, the, the things that lead her to Oak Hills, but also the things that will help her to survive. And then sometimes it's the intervention of somebody like Maxine, you know, as, and Maxine is, you know, she's wounded, but she's fierce, and she's also political, and she gets, she's able to give Renita a piece, a couple of pieces that she needs for that puzzle to move forward as well, you know, a sort of, they have a kind of, they share a kind of black liberatory politics, right, so she's able to, to develop that in her, and um, she has a kind of, con defi she calls it constructive defiance, you know, a way of being in the world like that, and so, um, and an, an imagination, she says, there's an imagination deficit in here. What can we do about that, right? So, so she kind of awakens or develops that, that resource in her. And then the father, you know, along with, the, along with the encyclopedias, you know, they grew a garden when she was little. And I, guess, I think um, na maybe I would say that books and nature, uh, a mm -hmm. connectedness to nature and its healing properties are the two biggest things she has to to draw on. So I don't know, that's, I'm, I'm babbling. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but you know, that, I think that's how, you, how fiction writers work, you know. I would say, I'm, the comment, I am struck that as you talk, I think you're providing the reader, even with your, your book jacket, more information about your process than maybe we usually have. So the research that you've done, it, you make that, you know, explicit in some ways through your acknowledgement of the people who, oh. ins who inspired you. Yeah. So we know you can draw from that. And I don't think that's always information that we have. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we just assume, perhaps, that yeah. it's imaginary mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe having some roots in the 
Well. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. But but yeah, and you know, but but I think ultimately, like I was saying about the metaphor, you know, that's in service to making it live. Like there, you could do, you could read everything there is about it, about a topic, and you could watch every movie and interview people, but you still have to breathe life into the characters on the page. And the play, and you still have to create a sense of place, you know, and I don't know, some of that's from teaching fiction writing for, for these 28 years at MIT, you know, but you plot character setting, those are the elements of a story, and you know, you have, you have to make that live, and you do that um, in lots of ways, in all those ways I guess I was describing, so. Yeah. yeah. So um, I have to say, again, that is absolutely beautiful. I have not read a novel straight through like this in a really, really long time. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I felt it as I was invited into the story, into Renita's life, there were moments where I'm like, she's not going to make it. Damn, how is this story going? To, I'm stopping myself from going to the end and reading it to see it. So I can calm my nerves, like, she's just going to be okay. So, how, how do you handle those moments when you are telling in it the hope? To, how did you hold on to the hope that she then has to find a way to hold on to uh -oh. and get us to the end? And I didn't cheat, I swear to God. I, didn't. <laughs> uh, I, I, I let myself. <laughs> no, that's and great. Of it wasn't well, that's great because what you said is means the most to me because that means you cared about her. I made yeah. her a person, and you cared, right? And that's the, I've done my job, you know. But um, I knew she. I wanted. I knew, so it wasn't a mystery to me. But I had to. <laughs> I knew how I wanted, was going to end up, you know. But I guess. But I think what what. Uh, so suspense is, you create suspense with the withholding of information, right? So I think there's, I mean, I had to have her make some stumbles, right? She has a couple of stumbles and, um, and is always within herself in this sort of, you know, di war, dilemma, you know, struggling to be her best self like, like, like we all are. Um, but but the I guess, world doesn't make it easy for her. Yeah, well, and I, so that was important to show how hard it was. Yeah. You know, to show all the different, all the different stumbles. But but then to one of my students um, said that uh, it was a lot. Of, it was very painful. All of the the you know back the historical stuff that that's, that you know the third person narrator um, del delivers. But that she always felt hope. And so you know, I, I guess I tried to have even when she's in, in the struggles, you know, about whether to use or, you know, encountering the man she had, um, who had gotten her using heroin and then how to, you know, keeping him at bay or dealing with all the, the pitfalls and maybe forgiving herself and opening up to the therapist. There are all these challenges, you know, that she, I wanted, so I guess I tried to sh show her struggling with them and the emotional complex, psychological complexity of that. Um, and, and then in terms of plotting, I think, you know, you keep the reader hooked by, not, by withholding some, some of the information. So you try to, you know, that's, a, that's about plotting. And I think you get that right just with a lot of revision. Because <laughs> I, I think there was an earlier version that was a little bit too, too linear mm. for, you know, her, her recovery or her healing was a little too linear. So, mm. so I tried to complicate it. And, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, oh, I right. would love to. <laughs> That's right. We've yeah. got book signing. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody, for coming. <laughs>